another human being is, I think, the noblest and most rewarding of activities. To bring this into my profession and to do it all day, it's euphoric. I came to Canada as an adult. I was in my early 20s and I came from Kenya, which is a third world country. My heritage is East Indian. And in India especially, but also in Kenya, the parity between the haves and the have-nots is very striking. Whether it was fair or not um, always bothered me, but my career took me down a different path and I worked in the corporate world and made good money. But. Um, Two years ago, my father passed away. Um, he lived with me and he suffered an illness and during the 18 months while uh, he was dying, my world changed and internally I, I started going back to keeping life simple, keeping some of your values, doing something that, that would, um, I guess, lead to good in the world. The whole idea about a Tiffin Day really came to me in, in the most simple of ways. I was packing a lunch for my son in a tiffin. That's what we did. We cooked our dinner at night and the leftovers I would pack in a tiffin for him to take to school. And I thought about how much I loved doing that. And why couldn't we make good food, pack it in a, in a package it in a tiffin and take it to somebody? Tiffin is a stainless steel container and it's stacked so you have different compartments that can hold different types of foods in there. It doesn't contain any lead or mercury or anything like that. It's food grade stainless steel and a very, very durable lunchbox. And it allows us to deliver these meals without traditional packaging. With our service, you get the tiffin, you eat the food, the tiffin is picked up by us, there is no garbage. It's literally um, a litterless meal. Tiffins are actually synonymous in Mumbai. Uh, what happens is the wives cook a meal at home and uh, pack it up into a tiffin. A series of couriers come and pick them up from different areas and get them to the men in their offices by noon. And there are millions of these being delivered every single day in Mumbai. Over here, a home cooked meal is not legal to sell as a business. So we make the food in a licensed restaurant. Um, my partnership with Udupi Palace over here in the India Gerard uh, Bazaar uh, allowed me to do this with uh, relatively little capital. Setting up a kitchen like this would be very, very expensive for an entrepreneur just starting out. But Udupi Palace allows us to come in here um, in the morning before the restaurant is operational. And as long as we're out of here by 10.30, our food gets prepared. So what happens is uh, the customer goes on our website and places their order and as long as their order is in by 4 o'clock today, we get them the lunch tomorrow. So in between 4 o'clock and 11 o'clock tomorrow, our work over here gets started and my job is to get here in the morning, pack it into the bags and get out the door and deliver the meals. It's very, very simple to get a good, nutritious, balanced meal every single day. But we've thrown in the complexity of the fast food industry and the convenience of the fast food industry and the cheapness of the fast food industry that has made all this other wonderful stuff about food kind of die by the wayside. And I don't think we as a human race have the right anymore to just think about ourselves. You need to eat healthy for yourself, but for the planet too. The menu that Tiffin Day offers is vegan. There are no animal byproducts, no milk, no butter, um, no eggs, uh, no cheese in our, in our uh, food. So the menu is chosen very, very strategically because a vegan meal, really at the end of the day, it's the most sustainable way to live. If I had um, butter chicken or some of the more um, delicious non-vegetarian Indian food on my menu, I'd probably have more customers faster. That's not the intent. Um, I need to grow this business socially, uh, socially and environmentally respectively. Tiffin Day has a triple bottom line, um, certainly to be fiscally uh, viable, uh, so money is a big part of it, but social hiring and environmental sustainability are two very important goals for us. All the staff that work here are um, immigrants uh, from India. We need them because they know the food. Uh, they also need an English as a second language type of environment to work in, and also part-time we have students who need extra hours. 
Then on the delivery side, we made a specific mandate to hire people with developmental disabilities. And right now, my overflow deliveries uh, take place with Good Foot Deliveries, that is a social purpose enterprise in Toronto. Um, they've got a model that works for them, and uh, we bring it all together. And it's really an ecosystem of social purpose businesses growing together. I'm hoping within five years, we would have at least three or four franchises within the city of Toronto so that we're covering the greater Toronto area. And um, hiring people who face barriers to employment, delivering them on, um, you know, using electric rickshaws and not polluting the world and, and just people eating healthy. It, it, I, I wish we could get there in five years. It'd be lovely. Good evening and welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. As always, we would like to thank CIBC for their generous support of this series. My name is Marielle Voxep. I am the Associate of Educational Events at Mars. And it seems that everyone else is on March break, so I'm here to introduce tonight's speaker. This week's topic is distribution with Mark Zimmerman. Mark is an advisor in the ICE practice here at Mars, the Information Technology Communications and Entertainment Practice. Mark has been working in the information and communication technology industry for more than 15 years with some of the biggest companies in the industry. But he's also worked with very early stage startups, so he knows what it's like to be in an entrepreneur's shoes. Mark uses his experience to help Mars clients in the areas of business to business, enterprise software and software as a service business models, as well as security and privacy. Please welcome Mark to the podium for tonight's distribution lecture. Hopefully I won't stay at the podium and bore you to tears sort of lecturing from over there. I'm going to try and take a subject that uh, at least uh, in theory is a little bit dry, the distribution of, uh, of a product and uh, hopefully make it uh, a little more um, exciting for you. Um, the number one reason why startups fail is we build a product that uh, does not have a market. You know, we, we, we build a solution to a problem that, not a, that nobody has. And the second reason why startups fail, the number two reason for startup failure is we found a problem, we have a solution for it, but we can't find enough customers cost effectively enough fast enough. And that's really what distribution is all about, finding enough customers fast enough to, to grow the business uh, in a sustainable way. So that's what I'm going to talk about is how to avoid the second leading cause of startup death, um, which is failing to get your distribution model right. Um, hopefully some of my colleagues, I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen all of the Entrepreneurship 101 uh, sessions predating this, but I think it's a fairly safe bet that somebody put up the four Ps um, in the course of, uh, uh, of doing this. Someone talked about marketing and talked about the, the four Ps, about product, price, place, and promotion. Um, I'm here to tell you that despite all the times people have said that to you, place is, really means distribution. Place doesn't just mean place. Uh, when people think about place in a marketing context, they are, you know, the sort of the model that it conjures up is the retail environment, the store where I go to buy um, the, the product in question. But uh, place is broader than that. Place is a placeholder, if you will, for distribution in that model. And uh, it really um, is meant to be oh, distribution with a trailing in. I forgot to send them my font. Uh, just for notes about presentations like this, make sure that you and the guy whose laptop you send this to have the same typefaces. Uh, that N looks right on my machine, doesn't look right on yours. But uh, uh, three parts to that model. Um, to distribution is really made up of three components. Uh, delivery, uh, getting the product or service to the physical place or to the virtual place where it's going to be bought. Uh, the selling of that, uh, that item, that product or service, so the sales part of that equation, and then the service that happens post the, the, the sale of that item. So three components that we're going to talk about, delivery, sales, and service. Um, they're usually thought of in that order. I've got to deliver it to the place of sale, I sell it, and then I service it afterwards. In, uh, in a lot of the companies that I deal with now, in the virtual companies and companies that are 
um, selling bits rather than objects or selling content rather than things. Uh, dis delivery and sales happen almost uh, at the same time and in fact uh, often happen in the opposite order. Um, the same principles apply, um, the same uh, thought process applies, but uh, you can think about this as sales, delivery and service if you're a, if you're a web company uh, versus delivery, sales and service um, if, you're, if you're selling physical goods. So we're going to dive into each of those three components. Each of them come in two flavors. Uh, so each of those three components of delivery, sales, and service come in two basic flavors. They come in direct and indirect. Um, so uh, the sort of the easiest one to think about is in the sales context. In a retail environment, you want to go buy a Macintosh. And uh, my apologies, Apple is strewn throughout these slides uh, as, as we go forward. I was putting this deck together on iPad 2 launch day, and I had a little bit of Apple on the brain as I was, uh, was putting it together. So there's a fair number of Apple examples strewn through here. Um, and uh, my apologies in advance. But if you are looking to buy a Mac, um, you can go to an Apple, one of Apple's stores. You can go to, that happens to be the Fifth Avenue uh, flagship store in the upper right there. Or you can go to Best Buy. Buying it at the Apple store is buying it direct. Buying it at the Best Buy store is buying it indirect. Um, it, direct and indirect are separated by the amount of control that the seller has, not by ownership. You, know, you, can, you don't have to own all of the things to be selling direct. Um, if you are selling online, you're selling on the web, um, you know, that's a direct sale, even though you don't own the servers, you don't own the, the infrastructure, it's not your internet. Um, but it's your customer relationship. You are the primary de uh, determiner, designer, executor of that customer relationship. That's a direct model. If you're, someone else is the, is, the, is the primary owner of that, or if you are um, sharing that customer experience, that's an indirect model. And it's okay to mix and match these things. In fact, in many cases, it's optimal to mix and match them, to sell some of your products direct, some of them indirect, to change that model over time and to change it based on the market that you're, that you're serving and on the stage of that market um, that, that you are at. So uh, in the early parts of this, to, to sell more direct, and in the later parts of, a, of the evolution of a business, to sell more indirect, and to mix and match those things. For startups, however, it is better to, in most cases, and I'm just going to put another caveat there, so the Apple caveat and the second one, being that I'm going to talk in generalities um, today. This is a big topic and a topic that, you know, sort of 40 minutes, probably four hours, maybe four days, doesn't do, do justice to. And so I'm going to say things, you know, like you, you should go direct um, in the early stages of a startup. And I mean most times in most situations. I'm going to sort of skip nuance in the interest of, 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 of getting through this stuff fine. But please read, you know, sort of rule of thumb when I, when I, when I speak with, with, with sort of absolutes there rather than uh, this works 100% of the time this way all the time. So, but as a general rule for a startup, um, focusing on one or the other of these in each of those three buckets of delivery, sales, and service at the beginning, figuring out how that model works and then expanding that distribution strategy over time once you've found uh, the, the right combination, once you've got a working example of channel A to then add channel B is probably the right thing. You've got limited time and resources and limited um, attention to pay to this, and so optimize a single uh, distribution model and then expand is, is, is a good guiding principle for this uh, in, a, in, a, in a startup context. Uh, so there's six flavors there. We've got you know three down one side. You can think of this as a matrix, the three parts and the two direct and indirect. So we've got six cells on that little table. And so that's a whole bunch of forks in the road already. And how do I choose which ones um, I'm going to go down? Which ones make sense for my business? Well, um, again, a tough question to answer in, in 40 minutes, but I'm going to try to identify for you um, some of the key things to think about in does doing that for your business. So for your particular startup, here are a few things to, to think about to help you choose. Um, the first and probably the most important one is what type of market am I entering? Um, so in the upper right hand corner there we have a Ferrari. Um, the sports car market is an existing market. The sort of the, the 
criteria of competition are pretty well known. You know, if you want to win, you want to be the next big sports car, you have to have more horsepower, be a little faster, zero to 60 than, than the other guy. Your red's got to be a little redder than the, the Ferrari red. Your, your suspension has to be a little lower. The sort of the vectors of competition, the criteria that the user uses to buy these things are pretty known. You know, you sort of know what, what it takes to win. That's an existing market and a startup or a new business that is entering that market um, is going to likely compete on, the, on those criteria. You have to be better or faster at one of those elements um, in order to win. Um, that's not a situation that most, that's a, a recipe for success for most startups. Disrupting an existing market or entering an existing market on its existing terms of competition is usually not a, not a good idea for a, for a startup, but folks do it, and if you do it, that's the, the definition. You're going to be competing on the terms of the market itself, so you're entering an existing market on its terms. Um, the second uh, picture there is a Segway down in the, in the bottom right hand corner. That's one of those two wheel, you know, sort of stand on it uh, things. That was certainly a brand new market. Um, when, uh, when Dean came and invented the, the Segway, there was no two wheeled personal transportation market. Um, I'd argue now with, with hindsight that there maybe wasn't one even when he entered it um, and that he was unable to, to create one, but it was brand new. It was a, we were offering the market and the consumer a brand new experience, a new opportunity that they did not have before. We were, so the, the distribution strategy that you need in that space is more about creating a market and defining the market than defining your place within it. Um, in the existing market, entering an existing market, you are defining how you're different, how you, how you are differentiated in that market. In the, uh, in, the ex in the new market, you're defining the market more than your place within it, or at least equally having to define the market and your place within it. Uh, most startups, uh, most successful startups anyway, are doing what's on the left. They are resegmenting an existing market. Um, so they're doing one of two things in that market, broadly defined. Um, they're either, that's a, by the way, that's an icon uh, personal float plane. Uh, can't buy one yet, but uh, it's, it's really cool and I'm dying to have one in my, in my driveway, so that's why that picture is there. That's part of how they differentiated that product. They looked at the um, existing aircraft market and said, you know, the reason, big part of the reason why people don't buy uh, Cessnas and float planes and, and the like, uh, besides the fact that, you know, I don't have $200,000 sort of floating around to, to do that with, is there's, there's a lot of complexity with the ongoing cost of ownership of that experience. I gotta store it somewhere. It's gotta, you know, I gotta rent a hangar. I gotta have an aircraft mechanic to, to fix it and maintain it. So these folks have taken that model and said, we're gonna build one that you can store in your garage um, so it collapses and fits in your garage. Um, we're not gonna have airplane guys fix it. We're gonna have boat guys fix it. Uh, so it uses boat marine engine parts. Um, and uh, so in doing that, they've built a product, and we don't know whether it's going to be successful or not, uh, it certainly remains to be seen, but uh, a product that redefines a market, redefines the vectors of the competition, and says we're going to carve out a niche that we think is underserved in that market. So we're going to create a new segment in an existing market. Two ways that's usually done, either <coughs> um, carving out a part of the market that hasn't been well served by somebody else, or being radically cheaper than the existing alternatives. So being sufficiently cheaper than the existing um, alternatives that you create new market space. Uh, probably the best example in, the, in, in my world, in the B2B software as a service world, is uh, Salesforce.com. The Salesforce.com folks looked at the enterprise CRM market and uh, said this has sort of got a minimum ticket price of $100,000. It's only sold to big enterprises. We're going to deliver that over the web, we're going to cut out you know, a bunch of features, but we're going to deliver a good enough experience over the web and create new market space. So we created a, a much cheaper um, option that entered the market from the bottom and then grew from there. So three market types existing, resegmented and new, and making the decision about which one of those or understanding which one of those you are is a key input in designing your distribution strategy effectively. Uh, the next thing that matters is what stage you are in that market. Are you in the early adopter part of that market? Are you selling Apple IIs um, where the user is content with it's half a solution, it, it doesn't quite do everything I need it to do, I'm okay that there's not a robust 
aftermarket service. In fact, that's a feature for me that I get to fix it myself and, and tinker with it in the, in the early part of that, uh, that market. Am I in the mid-market? You know, am, I, am I selling to the majority of folks? Am I selling sort of the, the MacBook um, up there? Or am I actually now chasing the laggards in the space or perhaps creating a new space, debatable, but uh, am I selling to folks in the later part of that uh, curve? Uh, I'm sure you've seen the technology adoption curve as well um, in earlier lectures that sort of uh, early adopters, the chasm, the early majority, the late majority. Which one of those markets you are selling to is another important input in, or what stage of the market you are in designing the right distribution strategy for, for your business? Uh, the next part is how complex is the product that I'm selling? Um, uh, buying a stereo, um, at least for me, is a complex uh, purchase. Um, I want to know how many HDMI ports does it have? Does it have 7.1 uh, speakers, 8.1, 12.1? I'm not even sure what we're up to, but I want to know, do I have all of the necessary things? Does it have all the right connectors, all of the right inputs, all of the right cables? Um, conversely, buying an iPod is a really simple experience. You know, I'm buying a product that comes, at least in, in the era of that picture, it only comes in white, um, and it came in two sizes, and do I want a 16 gig or a 32 gig one? And you know, it's a very simple product that you're selling. And so the complexity of your product, and not just of your product, but of the whole thing that the customer is buying. In that, uh, in that stereo example, if I'm the cable maker, I'm Monster, I make the, the Monster cables, my, my product is pretty simple. It's, you know, they're, they're cables, but it's part of a complex buying decision. So it's not just the, whether your product is complex or not, but is it part of a complex purchase is actually the more relevant uh, uh, decision to be thinking about. So if, if your thing is simple, but it's part of a complex sale, think of yourself as complex. In the, in the channel design part of, this, uh, part of this equation. So next vector is complexity. Uh, the price matters a whole lot. Um, both the, price at w the retail price at which you're selling this thing and probably equally importantly, the margin depth that you have in the, in, the, in the product that you're selling. So not just its price at the sort of the retail ticket, but um, you know, what, what kind of profitability you have at a gross margin level is a big input into how much you can afford to spend on a channel and what the optimal channel um, mix, mix, for, mix for you is. So your price is the next thing that you need to be thinking about when you are designing a distribution strategy. Um, and last on, on the list of ones that I'm going to talk to before we get a little more uh, specific is the customer's preference. Um, and both their preference um, now and also their history, the history of how they bought this. I mentioned Salesforce.com um, in the uh, you know, new market, existing market, resegmenting re a market uh, point of view. The guy in the upper right there, he's who sold Siebel, who was uh, Salesforce.com's uh, uh, competitive, uh, you know, who they targeted when they, when they designed that product. Um, Siebel was sold by guys in good suits. Um, who uh, you know came and uh, spent hours with uh, with a, with a customer, um, helping them buy the product, helping them design it, and also helping them perfect their golf game and their and their handicap. This was a, a very high margin, high ticket sale, and it was sold in that way. And when um, Salesforce.com said we're going to sell it in the bottom right, we're going to sell it with call centers and uh, and websites, they needed to invest in changing that customer's preference and in changing that customer's history and convincing the customer that it's okay to make this change. So you need to both understand how the customer would like to buy or be serviced or have delivered the products uh, that you're buying, but also how your competitors are doing that and what the established norms are in the, in the space that you, are, that you are looking to enter. So customer preference is a big part of that equation. Uh, I'm now going to really oversimplify. I was oversimplifying before. I'm going to really do it. And I'm going to give you a, a, a little chart here that sort of has direct on the left, indirect on the right, and takes each of those criteria and tries to put a bit of a stake in the ground as what would be the default answer, not knowing you know, a whole lot about a business, but if you said to me, by default, I have, I'm targeting an existing market, I'm going to compete on price, what's the What's the, the baseline channel strategy for me? So I'm going to walk through those and, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, some specifics. So first, in the market type, this one's an easy one and I'm happy to put this one up pretty definitively. If you are creating a brand new market, you are likely to go direct. 
Um, there isn't an existing channel that knows how to sell your product. Um, unless you're a much better salesperson than I am, you're not going to be able to convince an indirect organization to take a flyer on, uh, you know, you're not going to get Ford, a Ford dealer to stock Segways. Um, they're not going to believe you that there's a, a real market there. They're not, they're not prepared to make that, uh, that leap of faith for you. And even if they were, the price at which they would do that um, is likely one that you don't have margin depth for. So if you're creating a new market, um, which is a relatively rare thing, um, you're likely to do this direct. If you're competing in an existing market, uh, an existing market, um, uh, you are likely to use the existing channels or channels that mirror the existing channels. Your sort of go-to-market path is likely to be a lot like everybody else's um, in, that, in that space. And if you're resegmenting a market, you're going to sit in the middle there, you're going to lean towards direct to begin, and you're going to move towards indirect as you, as you get some traction in that market. So those are sort of some broad um, you know, signposts, if you will. Market stage, same general guidance. Uh, early stage, you're, you're going to do this uh, uh, direct. Later stages, you're going you're to do this indirect. Complexity, complex tends you towards direct. And it's important that uh, um, you know, that's the whole solutions complexity, not just your piece parts so, uh, uh, complexity. And um, a simple solution tends you towards indirect. Uh, Shoppers Drug Mart now sells iPods. Um, there's, there's no way Shoppers Drug Mart is going to carry uh, stereo equipment anytime soon. The degree of complexity, sort of package that up in a way that it can be sold in a retail channel um, you know, that isn't a specialist retail channel is, uh, is, is just not likely to happen. So that's product complexity in that, uh, in that matrix. Um, and then on the price, uh, more expensive things lean you towards a direct um, sales model, less expensive things lean you towards an indirect um, model, and uh, really the, it's sort of a function a little bit of the amount of hand-holding that you can offer. Um, whether you should or not is a strategic question, but you can um, offer a degree of hand-holding in an expensive product that you simply can't in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cheaper product. So just some signposts, directional at best. Um, but gives you a framework, and if you are if you are taking the exact opposite approach that's sort of on that list, um, it can be strategic differentiation. But you need to do it in a conscious way to say, you know, why am I going against the grain of my particular market entry strategy? Which can absolutely be the the right thing to do, but needs to be something you do consciously rather than something that you do, um, you know, as a as a as a as a path that's what's easiest for me. Um, some other big factors to, to think about in the course of doing this that don't lend themselves to, um, you know, to sort of simpler models. The, the size of the market that you're entering, the size of the market that you're attacking, um, it's diversity or complexity. Um, the, both a function of how different is that market from the market that you already know and the market that you're in, but also how many sub-segments are there in that market? How much customer intimacy do I need to have to sell that uh, product effectively? Uh, to use the stereo example again, um, the range of stereo buying criteria from folks who are happy with the sort of the it's all in one and it's uh, you know it comes in this size and it's got uh, only you know it's got three. Uh, three colors and this is what you get to the very advanced uh, uh, custom system. There's an awful lot of buying criteria there, so it's a very complex market. So you need to think about how simple or how complex is the, are the buying personas within the market that, uh, that I'm going to enter. Um, the proximity of that market, uh, both, and, and I put proximity in quotes there because it matters the geography of that market, so distance um, you know, tends you to, uh, to, to going indirect if that market is farther away um, from, from where you are. But don't think of that just in a geographic sense. That's also proximity to my existing customer base. Um, as you were thinking about, you know, hey, I'm going to extend my product or I've got uh, version two of my product, whether it's close to what you do now to your existing market, uh, measure proximity both in geography but also in adjacency to, to what it is that uh, you already do. So proximity matters. Um, I talked about the completeness of the offering. You know, are you selling a piece part or a whole solution? Uh, I, I think Krista Jones was, uh, was last week's uh, lecture, and she has a slide that, uh, that I love that says nobody buys, whole, uh, nobody buys drills, people buy holes. 
Uh, people, people want the solution. They want an answer to their problem. They're not interested in the interim steps, or at least they don't buy the interim steps. Um, so if your thing is part of a solution, you need to think about the completeness of, of, of what it is that you're offering. Um, the cost of the channel, can you afford it? Can you make um, enough margin, of course, being a key part of that? And then the speed of the channel. Different channels take different um, lengths of time to develop. Um, in the in the web world, very easy uh, to throw up a, a website, uh, plug in a little PayPal, get a shopping cart from shop to it, and on Tuesday you can be selling your you know your your virtual goods um, over the over the web. Um, so that channel has a very low, at least initial speed to market. It may take much longer to make that channel uh, robust and to breathe life into it and, and breathe sort of the right volume into it. But your getting started time is is near zero. Um, an indirect market, if you said you wanted to sell, um, you know, a piece of hardware at Best Buy, the, the lead time to get on their roadmap and get that thing into uh, their distribution channels and so on, you are probably looking from yes, from not forgetting the sales process or to convincing them to carry it, but sort of, you know, they've said yes and now it's going to go on the shelf. You're looking at probably six months, you know, kind of lead time to, to make that happen. So the, for the first product, your first SKU in that, uh, in, in that space, you're a little faster as you, as you add others, but decent benchmark for, for where you're going to go. So the speed of the channel also matters uh, a whole lot, uh, depending on the type of market you're chasing and what you think the competitive landscape uh, uh, in, in an imperfect world, you know, it's a startup. You don't really know uh, what the three other guys or three other people in their, in their garage are, are working on, but, uh, um, you know, you, what your perception about your need for speed is in the particular market you're entering. Um, but all the things that I've just talked about describe distribution as if it's a tactic, and it is a tactic for many companies in many places. Um, a lot of the time it's a tactical decision. But there are instances where this is a strategic decision, and for, comp and for certain companies this is a strategic decision. Um, a couple uh, real textbook examples here, uh, Amazon.com, the decision to sort of sell uh, a traditional product, no real product differentiation, the book is the same book that I got, but distribution differentiation in that I'm going to sell it all online. I'm not going to have any physical uh, properties and you know all of the the ensuing benefits that that come from making that distribution strategy. So distribution as competitive differentiation in, in that case. Um, Dell uh, both on the supply chain on the back end part of the delivery of their of their product to you but also on the on the sales model ha had a long run of sustainable differentiation by having a better distribution strategy. That's starting to decay now um, as uh, as their competitors uh, catch up to those distribution innovations, but a, a long run there. Uh, Zappos up there, and I'm sad to say if you haven't heard, Zappos has stopped shipping to Canada, uh, which is a horrible thing. Zappos sells shoes online um, and made a huge effort to say there's not much to pick amongst you know online shoe retailers. I'm buying the, the same pair of shoes. I probably tried them on somewhere. I know the size nine uh, Nike fits me, and I'm, I'm ordering those. So decided to differentiate on the service part of their distribution model to say we're going to give a radically better customer service experience, particularly post sale. You've bought the thing and I'm now going to deliver not just the shoes that you bought, but I'm going to sell you, I'm going to put an extra pair of shoelaces in there, a thank you note, and, uh, and so on. I'm going to innovate on the, on the delivery and service part post sale. Um, so very viable. Um, the Apple case, uh, just because I had Apple on the brain, um, the iPad 2 sort of launching a product like that without that distribution network, without those 700, I think they're up to about 700 physical stores. This is a, a thing that to buy it, you need to touch it and feel it and, you know, kind of have that experience if you're not a, an early adopter who's going to sort of take it on faith. Um, that you that you need the next Apple gadget. I'm one of those guys. I need the next gadget. I don't sort of I don't ask, but most of the market wants to touch it and feel it and play with it. Um, and having that retail environment is a huge competitive advantage in terms of distribution to allow those things to innovate. As uh, as Rim launches a competitive device, not having that distribution network is going to be a big problem for for them as uh, as they go forward. Because Best Buy is just not set up to provide that same sort of trial experience. Uh, certainly the carrier store, the Rogers store, isn't set up um, in, that, in that way. So uh, this can certainly be a strategy. And I'm now going to walk you through quickly a case study of somebody who made distribution a, uh, a competitive differentiator. Um, anybody know what those are? 
Yeah, those are Nespresso coffee. That's dehydrated coffee in an aluminum tin. Um, and uh, in a little aluminum thing, they're about, uh, they look a bit like a creamer, an oversized creamer, um, and that's an espresso pod. Um, that's what it turns into. You put it in an espresso machine and it turns you into, uh, it turns it into a exactly the same every time Nespresso coffee. You know, it's uh, the amount of water, the temperature of the water, all of it is exactly the same so that I get the same uh, uh, cup of coffee each time. And uh, that's, the, that's the value proposition that I'm going to give you a, an exactly right, they would say a perfect cup of coffee. My local coffee shop would argue that, um, but a perfect cup of coffee exactly the same every time. So that's the product. Um, they're relatively new, um, you know, in terms of seeing them in the, in the Canadian, in Canadian market and uh, seeing similar systems, but it's not a new idea. Um, it was invented in 1970, it was patented in 1976, um, and then for 10 years not much happened with it, and in 1986 the, the Nestle folks created Nespresso and, uh, and went and, uh, and took this idea to market. Um, the way they took it to market, the distribution strategy and so on was, we're going to package this up as a complete solution. So uh, you get the machine, a service contract, um, we will do the logistics of making sure you have Nespresso pods at your restaurant or office, that you've got enough of them all the time, um, and you pay us on a fixed price. You don't buy the machine, you don't buy the service, you just pay us on a cost per cup kind of basis, and away you go. So that was the value proposition that they went to market, you know, $2 or two, uh, two, two euros a cup, and uh, um, away you go, all in. It's all bundled together, and uh, away you go. An interesting product, uh, uh, solving an obvious, you know, a problem that uh, they believed restaurants and, and offices had, that uh, it was nobody's job to make sure there was a good cup of coffee. Nobody, you know, cleans out the coffee pot, at least in my office, it's always sort of half warm and, uh, you know, kind of got some gunge in it, and and uh, you, you end up going to Tim Hortons, and you know, so um, let's uh, let's let's solve that problem. And certainly for restaurants, uh, speed is of the essence. You know, we want to sell the customer. Uh, uh, you know, make sure we sell them that coffee, but we want to make sure that we're making money on that, and we're turning that table as quick as possible, and getting somebody else into the space quickly. So that's the value proposition. Made sense to everybody at uh, at, at, at Nes as an espresso. Um, unfortunately, didn't make a whole lot of sense in the market. Um, two years later. Um, they were convinced it was a dud, um, it was going nowhere, they had sold uh, uh, less than 10,000 machines um, and most of them they'd given away, they had sort of jammed them into the channel, gone to restaurant chains and said, you know, hey, put this in all of your stores and we'll hope that we kind of make it up in volume as they, as they, as they say, but a, a, a dud. Um, they strongly considered shutting, shutting the, the product down. Um, they, uh, you know, they had actually gone so far as to, to invoke the note. They had a contract with the manufacturer of the, uh, of, the, of the actual machines that they had to give them 60 days notice when they stopped making them. They gave them the notice. So they were, they were pretty sure they were gonna, gonna stop. Um, they, at the last minute, reconsidered and did what we now call a pivot in the startup language, though um, in 1989 that term wasn't uh, uh, in, the, in the zeitgeist, uh, as you know, sort of lean startup uh, movement didn't exist, but that's what they did. They hired a guy named Jean-Paul Gallard as the commercial director, and he went in and did triage on the business, said, what's broken here? Um, and at the end of the day, came up with two insights. Um, the first one is we're going to separate the machine and the coffee. We're not going to try and sell these things together. Um, nobody else sells them together. Everybody else sells them separately. You buy a machine, you buy a coffee. Um, the idea of banging these together was, uh, was maybe innovative, but the market wasn't ready. It didn't fit that customer preference, um, you know, sort of that customer history, the way the customer was habitually kind of buying this. And we're going to stop selling to offices and restaurants. We're going to sell to consumers. We're going to change who we, who we market this product to. So what did they do? Um, they said, we're going to take the product and we're going to have it manufactured and serviced by third parties. So uh, we go to consumer electronics folks, we go to uh, coffee makers and we say to them, you make it, you, we license you our patents on very favorable terms, you're going to make the, the hardware and you're going to worry about both the manufacturing of it, but also the after sales service. If it doesn't work, it breaks, it, uh, you know, it needs a, a new frim fram, you're going to supply the, the frim fram. And, they decided to sell it, not um, with their own sales force selling it uh, at enterprises, but we're going to sell it through the existing retail distribution network. We're going to sell it where people think 
they go to buy a coffee maker. You know, you go to a department store, you go to a uh, high street retailer uh, to buy these kinds of things, and we're going to uh, latch on to that existing independent distribution network. Um, and we're going to let the manufacturer handle delivery and stocking of that product in that distribution network. So we're not going to be in that business. Uh, we don't know anything about it. We're in the food business, and we're going to, you know, we're going to stick to, to stick to what we know. The only part of the machine business that they held on to was the training of the retail sales force. So the person in that independent retail store who actually demos the machine and says, you know, hey, this is how Nespresso works, isn't it great? And gives you the, that first sort of trial cup of coffee that they hope, um, you know, addicts you to the Nes Nes Nespresso process. Um, we're going to train them. And the reason for that was very deliberately that that's where the machine and the coffee intersect. Right? That's not, you're not buying the machine there, you're buying the output of the machine. So that even though it's a sale of the machine, the thing that the customer is assessing there is not the machine. They're assessing the product, they're assessing the hole, not the drill. Um, and so that's where um, they decided they needed to be involved in that process. So they handle the sales part of that equation. Um, you, in fact, you can't buy the coffee in that, in that environment. If you go in the initial model, in the beginning of this, that's, there's some nuance there. They've changed a few of those things as they've, as they've evolved. But when you first bought that machine, they'd send you home with a week's supply of coffee included in the price of the machine, but you couldn't buy more. You couldn't say, I want to take a month. I'm going to my chalet and I want to take a month worth. Tough. Um, you have to go and phone Nespresso, sign up online, um, and become a member of the Nespresso Club. Uh, actually send you a card. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen it, they sort of do all of, do all of these things. They make, try to make it a, a whole experience. And we sell these things online direct, and we promise delivery inside of 24 hours. So we're going to get you the, the coffee that you need. We're going to make sure that you are not, you, you are not uh, without coffee for any uh, length of time. So changed the distribution model in the delivery aspect, in the sales aspect, and in the service aspect of the product, and in fact built separate answers to those questions for the machine and for the, the coffee pods themselves. So split the business into two chunks and built new distribution models for each of them. So how'd it work? Um, it worked really, oh, there's a slide, supposed to be a slide that says how it worked. It worked really well, trust me. Um, I'm going to show you some of the results in a sec, but uh, um, it was a huge success, the change. And then as the market matured, as it evolved, as they added, um, you know, things to it, they evolved that channel strategy. So that baseline model worked, and that saved the business, said we don't have to shut this down, we're, we're you know, this division is going to, to survive, and now we can evolve. Uh, so to my, earth, my point at the beginning, that you want to sort of pick and focus and optimize one answer to this question and optimize it well, um, and that earns you the right to, to, to build the others is a good uh, you know, general direction for, for these kinds of things. So as the market matured, they began selling machines with their own brand. They still didn't make them. They said, we're not getting into the manufacturing uh, business, but we'll, we'll buy them from, from OEMs and we'll, you know, we'll stick our, our name on the, on the, on the faceplate. Uh, that gives us uh, some more margin depth. That gives us some more control over the experience. And we see some niches that the other OEMs, the other manufacturers, Aren't um, aren't chasing that uh, that we want to chase, so we'll make machines for those. Particularly at the low end, they made sort of single, you know, home user. Put it in your dorm room. Put it uh, put it on your desk. In theory, if you really hate the coffee in uh, in, in your office, um, that kind of thing. Uh, that sort of price point. Um, they also created a set of their own direct distribution, some retail boutiques. Uh, there are actually new Nespre there are Nespresso stores. I don't think we have any yet in, in Canada, but uh, uh, they've dotted them around the globe. And uh, you can go in and not just buy a cup of coffee. You can buy, you know, if you like the cup of coffee, you can then, it's sort of, it's, a, it's Starbucks, but you can take it home with you is sort of the, is the, is the mental model. Uh, though I guess you can now do that with those little Starbucks via pads, at least in uh, packs, at least in theory. Um, and then they actually, after that, a couple of years into the, into the model, um, created the Nespresso Pro channel, said, you know what, our initial thesis that there was a market here in the office and uh, restaurant space was valid. There was a market here. We just had gone after that market in the wrong way. Um, and so they said, you know, we had a product that, or a solution to it, to a valid problem, but we designed the channels wrong. So we're going to go back at that existing market now with redesigned um, channels, and uh, they recreated uh, their attack on that market through what they call the Nespresso Pro channel uh, to sell into the office uh, market. So a little bit about uh, how that worked, some of the results. Uh, it's 
the graph went up and to the right, which is a good thing. That's how you want uh, uh, your, your, your startup to unfold, and it did, and it did that impressively. Um, they've sold 12 million machines, give or take. Um, uh, at, uh, I think that's a 2009 number. They've sold 20 billion of those little, uh, those little coffee pods, um, and uh, that's been, been pretty successful. It's available in 50 countries um, and counting. Um, sort of, they, they have a very interesting model as an aside of sort of where, when a country reaches a certain socio-demographic uh, income per head level, that you know, here's where it now makes sense that we think we can sell aspirational coffee. Um, and uh, so they, they add countries as those countries uh, develop economically, and they're at 50 and change um, as we go. Um, this number is the one that staggers me, sort of to have a 30% compound annual growth rate for a startup from, you know, when, you, when it's an idea and you're, you're beginning is, is okay, you're doing pretty good if you get a 30% compound annual growth rate. But as your numbers get bigger, 30% gets really hard. Um, and to do 30% over a 10-year period, and in fact, to actually be accelerating the pace of that growth in the last couple of years, actually that CAGR is going faster um, rather than slower as the denominator gets bigger is really hard. Um, and this is an impressive result to say we've done a 30% CAGR over a 10-year period uh, is impressive. And when you do that, when you start from a small baseline and you do that, you get to $3 billion in annual revenue. Um, so the answer to the, the question of, uh, you know, at the beginning, sort of what does startup death look like? First, it looks like we got our product wrong. Um, and you solve that, you got the right product, you're selling a solution to a valid problem uh, is step one. Step two, and th they had that right at the beginning. They, they had a, a valid solution to a, to, a, to a real problem. The product was right. But they failed in step two in the initial conception. Um, they didn't have the right channel, the right distribution model to take that product to market. And so this would have been a zero billion dollar um, company uh, if they hadn't pivoted on the, on the distribution. Um, they rethought the distribution model, made some very interesting innovations in all three of the, the key areas in delivery, sales and service. It took both indirect and direct approaches there and turned uh, what would have been a, you know, sort of a footnote in the coffee world into a three billion dollar business. Um, so that's uh, distribution uh, innovation for me, and uh, that's uh, uh, my the, the sort of the talk part of, uh, of of this exercise. Those are my slides, the sort of the the, the background, and I'm happy to take questions, comments, suggestions. Uh, uh, have a little more discussion about um, what this means for for your business and uh, your particular um, situation. I hope. Uh, Hope you found it enlightening, and if uh, uh, you want to ask questions, eat best to kind of come up to, to one of the microphones and uh, make sure that we can preserve your question for posterity. Uh, you can see all the, the cameras and, uh, and so on, and make sure you get your, your, your two minutes of internet fame. Uh, so um, without further ado, questions, comments, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question about um, the Segway example you mentioned. Um, uh, I, I, it's an interesting product because, you know, when it came out, it, it was a big buzz and, and um, uh, lots of activity around it. And I'm curious to know whether if, uh, if it's a good example of, of, of failure, because I think you recently sold the company in December for 10 to $11 million, and I'm wondering, whether you think that's a good example of a product that is kind of a blue ocean type product where it, 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 it creates a, it, uh, it sort of invent a market for itself and there's no competition, but it fell short of, of, of actually um, return and getting the return on the investment that was expected. I'm curious to know whether you think there was a problem in creating the right distribution model to, to actually market that product. No, I didn't mean to cite that as a distribution model failure. I think there's a long list of reasons why Segways didn't take off, but the distribution model isn't, uh, you know, isn't, isn't the one I would point to. I really meant to put it up there only as illustrative of creating a new market. Um, you know, it is a brand new uh, market. I'd argue that, uh, you know, iPads are a brand new market. That market didn't exist. It's not the existing tablet market. It's a brand new market. Um, 
interesting example, local example, is the RIM folks when they created the research, you know, the, the, the original BlackBerry device, had the choice of saying this is a wireless email device and it would have been a brand new market. You know, there weren't wireless email devices. They didn't. They very deliberately said we're going to resegment an existing market and said, you know, actually how we're going to take this to market is we're going to call it an interactive pager. Uh, it's not really an interactive pager, it's a wireless email device, but we're going we're gonna to squint and we're going to call it an interactive pager because then people have the, the, the sort of the vectors to compare it against. And in the Segway case, there's nothing to compare it against. The alternatives are unclear. Is it a replacement for my car or a replacement for walking? Is it a replacement, for, you know, sort of what it's designed, what problem it's designed to solve is unclear. And I don't think they ever got that well articulated. So it wasn't a distribution problem, it was a solution in search of problem. Um, they didn't sort of solve part one, um, so you don't, you don't earn the right to go to part two. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, on one hand, I love listening to case studies. They're compelling, they're inspiring. On the other hand, I hate case studies because I feel like such a dummy when I'm sitting as a startup trying to look at my own issues of distribution and a thousand other issues. So taking it from this latter perspective, uh, where you don't have the beauty of already having done it. <laughs> what would you suggest in startup situations to puzzle through this kind of issue? One of the things, for example, that comes to mind is experimentation. Are there ways you can cheaply experiment with potential well, with theories around what might be workable and what not? Right. So I'm, I, I think that's that, that's very valid, and I, I, I hesitate with the case study as as well for those for those reasons. But uh, I don't have a better better mousetrap for for that. Um, for a startup, to me, a startup is you know is all about designing smart experiments. To me, at, at the end of the day, and the distribution experiment is one that you should only embark on when you're sure that you've got sort of problem solution fit. You know, sort of all of your beginning parts of this are about validating that you have, you know, the, the part one. Do I have a real, you know, am I solving a real problem for a group of customers who are willing to pay me? And then step two is, how do I find a way to reach those customers in buckets, in efficient buckets? So I'd break that, you know, sort of what I would do with distribution into those two chunks. And in the first one, in the sort of, uh, you know, what in the, in the lean startup sort of world you'd call the customer discovery process, in that process, we're, we're really looking to validate that we have a real, pro, you know, that we're solving a real problem for, for, for real customers. And that, don't be fussed or as fussed about the scalability of those channels at that stage. You're just trying to say, you know, do I have a real market and does my problem, you know, do my band-aids work for this, for this, for this neck wound that, that, that the customer has? And then step two, once I found that, is yes, run the experiments and run them in order of, you know, what the sort of risk, risk discounted, uh, um, you know, cheapest is, right? You know, so you're going to have a roadmap that says, all right, I can try the online distribution of my product for, for near nothing. It's a, you know, fairly uh, uh, low, low risk experiment to run, run that experiment. Um, run it first because you can do it for those reasons. Um, but don't take failure in that model to say that that's failure of the, of the product if you've truly got the, you know, you've validated in the first stage that you really are solving a problem. It's, you know, if, that, if you have that answer, this answer is, is, is you know, is, a, is an equally valid set of experiments. Is that helpful or more too much case study still? <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, question is, do you have any do's or don'ts or recommendations when it comes to establishing your initial pricing, uh, which could be, you know, penetration level pricing to the market, and then transitioning to a price with greater margin? Like, what's the critical mass you reach when you know you can raise your price, or that you know you can't raise it before you know you can raise it, kind of thing? Um, well, very, very complicated question that's yeah. worth worth its own sort of set of lectures about price. From a you know, with the same sort of caveats about rules of thumb at the beginning, it's easier to lower your price. So I wouldn't start with uh, you know with, with penetration pricing in most cases, at least at the beginning. If I'm searching still for validation, is my idea good? Is you know, does it have does it have legs? Start with a higher price and then sort of bring that price down. Once you've found that answer, you know, you can start to draw a curve that says, how do I optimize for, for market penetration? But I'd start with trying to find what the upper bound of that pricing model is first, and then worry about how you, you know, how you grow the space under the curve. Uh. Hi, I actually have a, a case study type question. Um, so, um, do you have any examples or have you come across situations where, uh, you know, in order to differentiate 
a product offering, for example, um, you, you may be sort of working in partnership with your distribution channels on the promotional piece. So there's some sort of um, channel tie-in between the promotional end and cost sharing potentially and the distribution. Is that too vague a question? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, not, I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, I, I can think of examples where distribution is, you know, is, is, is quite tied together between sort of product maker and, and, and distribution partner, you know, that they are, um, uh, you know, sort of truly partners uh, rather than channels. Um, I think lots of those examples, but I can't sort of tell you whether that's, you know, good or bad for a particular situation right. unless well, you give well, me more context. would be helpful of the, that kind of partnership so that the, the, the distribution and the promotional end, there, there's a tie-in. Just Sure. So uh, one that immediately springs to mind is sort of the web space. There's a lot of sort of co-creation models. Uh, 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 I'm drawing a blank now. I just had it on to my tongue. Starts with a Z T-shirt company that uh, you know sort of outsources the design of the you know of the content that runs on those T-shirts or the the you know the elements to to the crowd. You can sort of go on the on the website, submit a design. We all vote on it, and you know ultimately they or they select them, and they're manufactured by a third party. So you know sort of the degree of intertwining of customer uh, you know sort of product experience and manufacturing, they got to be very intimately intertwined. Uh, uh, another kind of case study example, the Zara uh, fashion retail folks um, do a tremendous job of uh, really being tightly integrated with both their uh, logistics um, operation that's not theirs, but is uh, really supplies only them, or 90% of the business comes from, uh, you know, from that single single organization, and their manufacturing arms, which are partly owned and partly outsourced, and you know, work very intimately together. Going once. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, for coming. Uh, it was my pleasure to talk to you today, and uh, hope you enjoyed it.